welcome the speakers from this session. So, so Raulat, Bob, Robert, um, if you could all put up back your mics and uh, put the video back on. Uh, we have a number of questions and I'd also like to please invite the audience, everybody either on the Zoom call or on the broader webcast, please submit questions either in the Zoom chat or the webcast Q&A because I'm sure there are a lot of um, interesting questions that the audience may have for our speakers. So with that, I'd like to dive into each of your areas. Thank you for three really great presentations, really highlighting various aspects of what we need to do and the path forward to begin tackling some of these diseases. And we covered a lot of different angles. So with that, I'd really like to start with you, Bob, in terms of cystic fibrosis and what you learned. I mean, it's really a truly ama amazing story. You bring a lot of passion from your personal story. And I've watched you speak over the years, always with updates on your son and how novel therapies are actually making a very obviously critical impact in his life and the life of so many other patients. Could you talk a little bit more about, you know, there are clearly disparities when we think about orphan diseases, but even broader diseases where advocacy is making more or less of an impact, right? There's clearly a lot of success stories, but there's also a lot of areas where we haven't unfortunately seen a lot of success. And you highlighted, for example, the, the, the critical area, sort of that, that, that critical valley of death, if you will, of lack of research early in the stage, you know, where it's very, very risky and being able to corral forces and investment and attention to take that risk. And then bringing together whether it's government, uh, private groups, and obviously patient advocacy groups and pharma to advance these. Can you talk a little bit about some of the successes? What were the key success factors? And what have you seen work well in other disease areas in terms of patient advocacy? Yeah, first, first and foremost, advocacy is so important whether it's for rare genetic disorders where there isn't a big patient population or, or whether it's for underserved communities, right? We need to make sure that, that the patient is front and center, no matter what that unmet medical need is, no matter where they come from, no matter who their parents are, right? Like this is so important. And, and you know, even think about where we've, you know, and I'll, I'll talk about some good stuff, but think about where we've been horrible as, we, as it relates to uh, diversity in clinical trials, right? We need to do so much better to make sure that we engage people from underserved communities to participate in clinical trials. And that's something that really, really, open my eyes because look at it. My wife hasn't worked. She gave up her career when Bobby was born so she could bring him to clinical trials. How do you pay for parking when it's in Longwood if, if you can't afford to participate in a clinical trial? How do you do it if you don't have two parents in the home? Like, so you want to talk about, uh, uh, you know, the the lack of diversity and equity as it relates to clinical trials, we need to do much better there. And, and as scientists, you all know, uh, we're not making clinical trials look like the patient population. Are we being as accurate as we need to be, right? And I'm not a scientist and I can figure that out. So, I mean, that's really, really important. But, so advocacy is so important in many different areas. And, you know, let me focus on rare genetic disorders. I mean, I mean, when I talk to people, and say, oh, I have a cystic somatocystic fibrosis. They don't realize that that's an orphan disease that only 30,000 people in the U.S. have and 80,000 people globally. They think it's much more because we're loud and we're obnoxious and we beat the drum. So, so when I meet with parents who have, you know, kids with Dravet's disease, I'm like, you got to beat the drum. And, and, and all of it, like all this parent-powered powered innovation stuff that I talk about is, you know, just as important as raising money is to keep advancing things, uh, awareness is just as important. Awareness. I mean, I always say, we always say you hear people in the in the it, it, rare disease day, right? We just came off rare disease month. And when you look at the reality is rare diseases aren't rare to the person who has it. And it certainly isn't rare when you add up all rare diseases. Right. And then what is the benefit of, of really figuring out how you can use messenger RNA for a disease? Well, lo and behold, in comes a, 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 a novel virus and we can use that science to unlock, you know, we're unlocking mysteries for other things. And that's why science is so important because you're just unlocking multiple mysteries. And you heard the doctor talking about how you can use it for different indications, right? That's what it's all about. And the key is advocacy is so important. I'm so excited to see how companies today, even if they're early stage companies, they build in the advocacy component to it. You know, and it's not just about think of clinical trials. How do you pick endpoints? 
right? It's not just always pulmonary function for kids with CF. What about the fact that they have GI issues? What about the fact that it takes, you know, three hours just to do your nebulizers a day? Can we do it quicker so that there's a quality of life component to it? All this stuff is so important and you don't know unless you talk to the patients and you talk to the families and you talk to the, you know, the, the caregivers and you talk to uh, those who are uh, helping through all this. So it, it's really, really important. And I just think we are so much better at it today than we were five years ago and we were better five years ago than we were 10 years ago. And we all just got to keep our eye on the ball and keep doing better because who benefits patients. That is so, that is so true. And thank you so much for always highlighting the importance of the patient. We're seeing this in a lot of diseases, new patient mm -hmm. endpoints that are truly important. I see that, for mm -hmm. example, in atrial fibrillation, where people are not really thinking as much about what the patient's going through. They're just putting yeah. them on rate control and letting them wait. And the patients hate it. And in fact, mm -hmm. their disease is progressing. So we see that in a lot of diseases where a lot of what the patient suffers actually progresses the disease. And we need to take that into account. And, and we're not doing enough of that. So thank you for right. highlighting that. Um, Ralat, can you talk a little bit more? Really great presentation about technologies and really innovating within clinical trials using these technologies and in many mm -hmm. cases addressing some of the things that we we're just talking about with Bob, which is novel endpoints and things that are truly important. We saw this in a presentation last week about novel sensors to bait, bait, do the six minute walk distance at home. So there's a lot of ways we can integrate these, whether it's you know algorithms developed from patient inputs, all kinds of things. How, how do you see that going in the future, both in terms of clinical trials, but also in clinical care? So I know you and I have talked about before about broad patient management. It's beyond just a single therapy or a single treatment. It's really this idea of broader patient management throughout the patient journey. Can you talk a little bit about where you see the field going and how quickly some of these things may be adopted more broadly? Yeah, no, thank you so much, uh, Grace. Um, and, and so m many of these tools, these um, sensors and wearables and, and digital tools, um, they have a potential for huge impact. Because even though I presented just COPD, having muscle, uh, patients with muscle dysfunction, uh, COPD patients aren't the only ones that are suffering from this. COPD, you know, um, cystic fibrosis patients can also suffer uh, from loss of lean muscle mass. I mean, so these uh, wearable sensors and these actual endpoints can actually be used broadly. However, I think the one thing that stops us from really adopting this fully is the fact that we need to make sure these endpoints are well validated and they're well validated for these different populations. Um, so it's really exciting. I mean, there's no uh, end to the number of different companies uh, with wearables and tech solutions. It's just ensuring that we actually have uh, good data that is actually coming from um, these tools because um, you're the data you get is only as good as the tool. And of course, if the tool is not representative of the populations, for instance, um, a lot of these uh, wearables for, uh, have um, uh, used different type of light sensors. And some of these light sensors, um, the wavelengths aren't able to be absorbed as well uh, in people with darker skin, for instance. So if you're going to test your digital tool on only a sub, uh, 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 you know, patients on with lighter skin color, you could be providing data that's not accurate to a large, uh, another large population of patients. So while it's exciting, and I'm, I'm really excited about all the potential tools, we do see limitations because we see that some of these tools that um, are in development, these wearables and sensors are not always um, broadly tested, so sometimes it can't be broadly applied. And that's why I think a collaboration would be great, um, a collaboration of just like the IMI, where we really fund these different new endpoints um, that are coming out and we really fund them. Um, and we incorporate not just academia who come uh, in academia is where many of these ideas are sprung from, but also um, people in industry who understand also the uh, operational and scale up aspect and also patients uh, in the development of these tools so that they can eventually be able to uh, be applied broadly. Thank you. And where do you see that going in terms of, of timing? Do you see like within the next five years, 
almost all of these diseases will have some aspect or endpoint, you know, that was used in clinical trials involving a technology, whether it be patient inputs or patient reported. Yes, yes, yes. Absolutely. And like I said, I do think um, with COVID-19, it's accelerated um, the push for these uh, digital tools and technologies. So I do think that many of these patients, uh, for instance, Parkinson's disease, they're, again, uh, sensors um, that uh, assess the uh, therapeutic effect um, by assessing the uh, um, the uh, the tremors that occur in Parkinson's disease. So these wearables, uh, rather than a patient telling you or you doing a scale in clinic, um, these sensors can provide objective information. And we're more and more moving towards objective information. And as you can see, the FDA has put together several different um, guidelines and platforms regarding digital tools. So I do think in the next five, definitely uh, by 2030, we're going to be seeing more and more uh, uh, major trials, phase three trials, where there's some kind of digital tool or some sensor incorporated that will be part eventually of the approval process for the disease and the drug. Thank you. I, I absolutely agree. And, and as, as we always know with technology, it's probably going to be even sooner than that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you so much. And, and so Robert, you know, really fascinating presentation and actually quite sobering when we think of the multiplicative effects of metabolic disorders and, and you know obesity. And the fact that all the demographic trends and sort of the, you know, the, the rise of sort of cheap packaged foods and fast food is really accelerating that. So that's a problem, you know, that part of the problem we can't address with drugs, unfortunately. However, can you talk a little bit more? I love the idea of being, there has been a lot of focus on one aspect of metabolic disease, you know, a drug for obesity or a drug for, you know, various aspects of that. I, I love your integrative approach, which is let's look at the totality of disease burden. Can you please expand upon that? What kind of, you know, do you see composite measures being developed or any of these being used more broadly in trials? Do you see you know, the agency taking a, a bigger role in that to be more effective. I mean, for example, in heart disease, I see, for example, uh, you know, patients with AF, but then they eventually they progress to heart failure. And I don't think there's a, enough of a focus of what about the overlap of those two, right? So can you talk a little bit about how that applies to the areas that you talked about? Yeah. Well, thanks for this question, because it's a truly important one. And uh, with heart failure studies, the has been more acceptance for composite endpoints. So uh, as you know, the six minutes walk test is, has been used, uh, heart failure, uh, admission to hospitals or, or cardiovascular mortality. So within a therapeutic or narrow therapeutic area, there is more, um, more possibilities to really to come with a uh, composite endpoint. Crossing therapeutic areas, kidney, heart, liver. Um, I think we need to start engaging in that discussion. That's why I really focus on the common cause. If we accept the common cause, well, the, the, the discussion around composite endpoints should also be an easier one to, to have. Um, because it is really cost prohibitive to continue the way we are doing today. And, and I think another drawback, if we are not going to do this, we are also missing the opportunity to optimize the use of a very efficacious drug. Because if it is uh, if it's not in label, then you can't use it in clinical care. So there is this is two-edged sword. So we need to be more creative. Um, so I think we really all need to start thinking about this and and, and develop uh, more efficacious and uh, strategies to make it possible to develop these drugs for a broader population. Um, and, and also coming back to, to, to Bob's comment on, on advocacy uh, and being loud and obnoxious definitely helps. Um, we have seen this in Europe as well with type 1 diabetes. Um, so type 1 diabetes, they couldn't use uh, home blood glucose monitoring because it was not reimbursed. CGM took ages. But when the patient organization, the advocacy organization started uh, yelling and shouting and, and, and being obnoxious, uh, it, it, it became reimbursed. So these advocacy groups, they are lacking in the obesity population. 
they are lacking in the type 2 diabetes population. So these are often people over 50 years of age. Uh, they don't want to be seen as obnoxious and, and loud. They want to behave. Well, if you behave, you don't get anything done. Uh, and I'm really puzzled with the question, so why is it that obesity is accepted as something normal? It is the new norm. And still we are spending trillions of dollars to manage the disease, or to, not to manage the disease, to manage the consequences of the disease. So th this is a conundrum I'm, 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 I'm deeply struggling with. So why are not the incentives placed in the society to fight obesity? Why is it so difficult to develop obesity drugs? Why is it so difficult to think of a way to uh, make these drugs more widely available and, and, and used? So I think these are the key questions we also need to address, not just focusing on just our uh, interest in as a pharmaceutical company, but put it to more in, 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 in a societal perspective. Thank you for that. I mean, as you were presenting, what was one of the things that was running through my head was the fact that you have all these different disciplines and we're traditionally very siloed. So you have endocrinology, cardiology, nephrology, and all of a sudden, you know, who is the PI for these studies? You know, is, it, it needs to be a collaboration. And also once new drugs or treatments are out there, who's prescribing them? Who's managing the patient holistically? Yeah. This is where I personally find exciting some of these new models like the Livongo model, Omada Health, Verta Health, where it really is a cross-functional integration of all yeah. the different factors. It's not just one drug or one intervention, it's everything. It's coaching, yeah. it's behavioral management. Exactly. And these I think may have tremendous promise. And obviously we always need new therapies because there's some things we can address with therapy, but it's not gonna be the only solution. No. So can you think a little bit about how, you know, for example, how Lily is thinking about those types of approaches and getting beyond a drug, yeah. but thinking more holistically, maybe even different business models for chronic care management? No, absolutely. So it starts with acceptance of obesity as a disease. If people st still think this is a self-inflicted uh, condition, we are getting nowhere. So that's number one. Second is drug development should be done in collaboration with um, interventions that are focused on lifestyle, cognitive behavior therapy, or um, exercise programs, but professionally delivered uh, lifestyle interventions. So working together with healthcare systems is one way to do this, to, um, to develop programs that can test the drug in the real world is, is one way to do this. And uh, also to really to manage monitoring the, um, the, the different endpoints within a real world setting to test the effectiveness is, is, a, is the last component. So we really need to start with the acceptance, uh, with the delivering lifestyle interventions, the, the drug delivery and monitoring the, the disease burden. Uh, I think that's, that's the only way forward which would be feasible uh, and which can be done in partnership and which, which generates data that are clinically relevant and relevant for payers and relevant for the society. So I think that is maybe a bit of an ambitious target, but I think that's the way that's the way forward. I would absolutely agree. And and now before we continue this discussion, I want to make sure we give the opportunity. I know we may have a question or two, um, Amanda and team. If you would like to um, highlight any questions that have come from the audience, we'll turn to that for a bit, and then we'll come back if there's time for additional questions here. Sure. Uh, I think this topic has. People very excited. We have a lot of questions coming in. Um, so one related to just um, what you were talking about is how are monitoring and technologies that are currently available for weight loss to monitor for healthy diet and clinical outcomes? And how might this impact clinical outcome or drug effectiveness? Mm -hmm. the apps used by companies like Weight Watchers might be an example. So there, well, I think the whole obesity, uh, non-pharmacological uh, obesity business is, is a multi-billion dollar business and it's very difficult to differentiate efficacious measures and, and 
non-efficacious, let's put it friendly. Um, so we need to make sure that we can deliver on the efficacious met methods that really has been demonstrated to be efficacious also in the long term. And trying to administer those in combination with novel drug therapies. So as I also mentioned to Grace, let's try to initiate integrative measures, but only integrating those measures that have been proven to be efficacious. Uh, there's too much humbug in, in, in obesity, um, which makes it very difficult to really de differentiate the, the efficacious methods from non-efficacious or even harmful measures. Uh, a lot of diets have been demonstrated to be harmful. Um, so we need to be very, very careful in how we, we approach this. But again, now I'll continue to reiterate this. Let's, let's start accepting this condition as a disease that needs very, very serious and uh, uh, scientific approaches to, to, to manage this uh, condition. Thank you. Amanda, next question. Uh, yes. Okay. How would the concepts or lexicons of allostasis, allostatic load, allostatic overload, and behavioral economics fit the equation of understanding obesity and other chronic diseases inclusive of the overall systemic health? Back to you, Robert, I think. <laughs> a lot of, lot of a, questions. That's above my page, right? Topic. Well, okay, well. <laughs> I think this is going over my head. <laughs> uh, can you translate this question to me? Oh. I can. I can try. This is not uh, my background. Uh, I think it's a uh, a technical question relating to uh, the concept of allostasis. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I'm no. I'm not going to, to, to bluff my way through this question, so I, I prefer to uh, defer to someone else who can, can answer that question. Yeah, I don't, I don't have an answer. Does anybody on the panel? Sorry about uh, that. I let, I let you know up front, I'm a recovering politician. I'm a political scientist. <laughs> uh, that one went with, Robert, if it went over your head, I can't, it's, in a, it's in a different level for me. But Bob, you should be good at bluffing then. No kidding. I can bluff it, but you're all going to call me out on it. So I'm not even going to bother. You're way too yeah. smart. Rola, did you have a, a comment? Uh, same for me. I apologize, though. <laughs> um, I, I, I think we need more clarification on the question. Uh, yeah. to, to be honest, we do need more clarification. But I did want to just um, follow back up on, on something Robert said uh, about um, blaming the patient for their disease. I think. Uh, you know, this is what we see in a lot of diseases, chronic diseases, including COPD, people blame the patients and say, you know, you smoked, you didn't go nicotine, it is quite addictive. So, you know, one of the ways we can move forward is by uh, uh, looking at the disease ra rather than um, focusing on, you know, the patient risk factors, because many risk factors are actually due to social determinants of health things that are totally out of the patient's control. So um, that will really help us move forward in the way we think of disease. You bring up a great point because, you know, COPD is not just, a, for example, a disease of smokers, right? It's environmental factors. It's other risk factors as well. It's genetic factors. And so this whole blame the patient um, and people, metabolic disorder is, is a big problem. It's not just, you know, overeating. There's so many factors that, that are brought into that. Um, and underserved populations are definitely hit the hardest. Um, mm -hmm. so, so with that in mind, Amanda, next, uh, next question. And apologies to the person who asked the question. Maybe you can send the clarification. Uh, sure thing. Uh, so I think this is something that came up in our, our previous meetings and that you all touched on a little bit, but um, maybe you can comment more about um, how the enterprise might um, think about intervening in some of these diseases sooner, uh, since many therapies right now are targeted at later stage diseases. So um, what would go into uh, um, intervening in early stage disease instead? Yeah. Bob, do you want to touch on that, given all the work that you did looking at sort of early, you know, early interventions for, for CF? 
Yeah, and, and that's that's the key. And you know, I met with parents who had uh, children with Rett syndrome early on when they didn't even identify the mutation that caused it yet. I said, let's go raise three hundred thousand dollars, hire the smartest person that we can find in this space, try to identify the gene, and then take it from there. Look at how far we've come in a short period of time. And it didn't take the you know the the hundreds of millions or over billion dollars, uh, billions of dollars that it took at CF because we got better than that. And to, to follow up on that point, Robert, you talked about, you know, how we, it, it, in, and I talked about uh, how it, it's important that we get loud and obnoxious. Think about that. You know, think about this, ladies and gentlemen, that, that folks, it was so easy to raise money for cystic fibrosis and there weren't a lot of patients because it was beautiful little babies dying. Right? Why? I've tried to raise money for infection and antibiotics and anti infectives. Not very sexy. I've tried to raise money for a type 2 diabetes. Again, not very sexy. I've tried to raise money for Alzheimer's. Well, they're old. They're going to die anyway. Like that mentality, please don't take me as feeling that way. I'm not saying that. But we need to create, create, we need to treat when you talk about the enterprise, right? Let's type 2 diabetes. Yeah, let's treat it like we tra treated Operation Warp Speed for COVID. Think of the systemic cost to society and the loss of life and the loss of quality of life. And you're right. One thing that I learned as a lawmaker from a fairly affluent, upscale, you know, I, I learned a lot about, you know, what this privilege really meant in, in the last several years. As a lawmaker, I would be like, well, how? why are people from underserved communities Oh, suffering from why is there so much healthcare disparity? Well, look at what they're eating because it's affordable, right? It's pretty expensive to get all your food at Whole Foods, right? With all due respect to Whole Foods. And, and so think about it, right? We need to treat this early. We need to, and, and, and again, why our healthcare system isn't incentivized to do it, right? Because then, you know, I always say, if you want to get in an industry where there's no risk, get into insurance, just say no to everything until you get prior offs up the kazoo. And then you'll finally agree to get on a novel therapy that's going to save money. They don't want to do that because the people are moving from system to system. And, and, and the thing, uh, like, I, I get so excited, Raul, when you talk about technology, because the only way we're going to be able to break that broken or rebuild that broken system is utilize technology to really track costs avoided through wellness. We need a healthcare yeah. system, not a sick care system. System. And then people, hey, if we could invent a therapy that put, staves off the, the symptoms of Alzheimer's five years, you'd solve the national debt problem. Why aren't we doing it? We got the people smart enough to come up with three vaccines in less than a year. Yeah. Right? We can do it. And because you know, generous I am yeah. when I say we, I'm really not a part of it, but I like to say we anyway. You are an integral part of it, absolutely. <laughs> and and I think, you know, when you talk about, you know, what Robert was talking about, where if you think about sort of early to midlife, obesity, metabolic syndrome, chronic kidney disease, we need a, the same kind of focus on aging diseases, right? Parkinson's, yes. Alzheimer's, and plus yes. all of those Robert was talking about that impact. That is the biggest, going to be the biggest demographic, by far the biggest cost of the healthcare system. And yep. there is a lot of investment in longevity. And what I fear is that, you know, in some cases it might be we're going to find this one sexy new drug. I think that the cases that will really or the, the efforts that I think will really pay off will be these integrative views about, you know, what's going on in the aging population. How can we think in a more integrative way about everything mm -hmm. that's going on? And we absolutely do. Don't get me wrong. We need breakthrough therapies for a lot of these neurological disorders and diseases of aging. But there's also a lot of the same things that Robert was talking about that would apply to that population. Absolutely. Um, anybody, Raul, anyone else commenting on the kind of the early part of innovation? Uh, you know, Sanofi, how is Sanofi thinking about some of the earlier stage risk taking? You know, Bob also mentioned technologies for which we may not have an application yet, but they're important to invest in. Yeah, thank you. And uh, apologies, I've been having a little bit of technical issues so I'm on my phone. So, oh, sorry. Um, so one thing about these technologies is that they can detect um, unmet need, disease burden, um, that we don't normally detect through traditional routes. So that's the goal. And so, you know, yes, um, you know, we do try to, uh, 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 you know, um, look at how when we're doing our proof of mechanism studies, how we can also incorporate 
those type of tools like wearables, um, uh, activities um, in those um, early proof of mechanism studies. Um, so that's uh, that's where most of the these digital tools are being used because that's um, number one, it's an early stage, so you don't have to have a huge scale up to thousands and thousands of patients phase three before you actually know the technology works and the disease indication you're looking at. So, so that's that early stage of the development when it's in the uh, proof of concept, proof of mechanism stage, um, the drug is when where a lot of these technologies are being tested, such as um, being the uh, um, uh, visual tools to look at skin changes um, um, that may be uh, uh, modified by a drug. For instance, a drug that's maybe treating atopic dermatitis. Um, so the early phase of the uh, drug development is where we're actually using some of these digital tools before then launching on a bigger investment uh, later on. That makes a lot of sense. So um, last, I think we have time maybe for one more quick question because we're heading up to, to to break shortly. And I think this is a good question to end on and talk a little bit more. I mean, Raulot, for example, you talked about IMI. And I think both Bob and Robert have talked about, you know, the magnitude of some of these problems and the fact that we truly do need these cross stakeholder uh, partnerships that are really focused on long term goals, lots of involvement from nonprofits, government, for-profits, academia, patient engagement. How do we think about, you know, something like IMI in the areas we're talking about? We, we don't, we just don't have, we don't have something like that. Yeah, I, I, you know, Bob mentioned something. Uh, he was like warp speed for, for chronic diseases. I, lo I love that because it, everybody's focus and attention was on a specific goal and that goal it, it, it was to is to combat COVID, and yes, we need that kind of um, what IMI calls radical collaboration to be able to combat a lot of these diseases, such as diabetes, uh, COPD, these highly prevalent chronic diseases. Um, and so that kind of radical collaboration, where we're investing a lot of money, just like we did with um, the IMI. Uh, just like the IMI has done with some of these digital tools, I think it is the way forward to really be able to see that five, 10 year progress of the, uh, of the digital revolution in clinical trials and healthcare. Yeah, well, I, I fully agree with that. So the IMI is also very much focused on chronic diseases, on uh, NASH, on uh, type 2 diabetes, obesity. They just recently started a program called SOFIA, so where they bring regulatory, preclinical, uh, the uh, clinical epidemiology, so all the different expertises together in, in one consortium. Uh, it's not war speed. It, it, it is bureaucratic organization, but at least the intent is to bring all the disciplines together uh, to, and to define the problem and to suggest uh, solutions for that particular problem. So that's why I really enjoy working together with the uh, Michael Swatch on the different uh, on these different topics. Bob, why don't we wrap up with you with the call to action for loud and obnoxious radical collaboration? <laughs> you bet. Well, and think about it. It comes down to it really comes down to collaboration. Right, more people working closer together, and that includes everyone. Always says, "Why is there such a, a strong push for uh, ED and I right now?" As it relates to diversity and inclusion, I know in Massachusetts we were not. Yeah, it's the right thing to do, but it's a good business decision. The more diverse any organization is, the better the outcome. Scientific proof. Anyone prove that to me? Prove that wrong, and you, you, I, I can't. I, we, I'm not going to believe it because we know it isn't true. That's what it's all about. In Operation Warp Speed, hey, did you ever? Think. Think about it. I represented 1,400 biotech and pharmaceutical companies. If you asked me two years ago if Merck would manufacture something that Johnson & Johnson invented, I would have thought you were cuckoo. Okay? It's happening. I had a front row seat from a year ago today all the way up until a month ago as to what was going on as it relates to collaboration amongst these companies. I've never seen anything like it. And again, I've had the pleasure of talking to President Biden about Operation Warp Speed for other diseases. Let's do it. Let's just do it. And not just the U.S., every country, 
right? This is a this is global stuff here. This is about everybody who walks on the earth as a patient. Why wouldn't we collaborate? Solving unmet medical needs never going to go away because as human beings, we're not going to allow it to. Let's get better at it. Let's get better at it. We know how to do it. We know we can do it. So let's just do it. I love it. it and that's really, we've gone from the golden age of science into the platinum age. Let's, let's, you know, let's stop having the output that we deserve. Thank you so much. Well, well, everyone, I think that's a great note to end on for this session. You heard it first here. Bob is going to lead the way. <laughs> we're yeah. going yeah. to recruit him <laughs> to lead. <laughs> Sounds you like can a always idea. use your energy and inspiration. And I, I want to deeply thank all of the speakers, Bob, Rowlott, Robert, for a really phenomenal discussion. And, and really, this is only the beginning. We're going to have to continue to talk about how we can collaborate and continue a longer term discussion about how to come together to address these, these serious unmet needs. So I want to thank everybody very much who came to listen to this session, thank the speakers. Thank the National Academies and the team and the planning committee. We are now going to take approximately a 30 minute break. We're going to cut a little less. We're going to come back at 115 EST to then uh, wrap up with the final session where we're going to be talking to all the session moderators on key learnings from each of the session over this fantastic three week, uh, three part program. And we look forward to seeing you shortly in about 26 minutes. Thank you all very much.